Cars, start your engines! Hit the pace car! What for? Because you hit every other damn thing out there, I want you to be perfect! When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. He didn't slam you, he didn't bump you, he didn't nudge you, he rubbed you, and rubbing son is racing. Good evening, race fans. Welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network, and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santoroski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk over the, talk about the week in racing. Joining me in the studio tonight are Mr. Richard Uden and Mr. Seth Eggert. Fellas, how we doing tonight? Doing good. All right, great to talk to you both. Now, we uh, have a lot of racing to discuss. Uh, the uh, knocking out the headlines. The winners this week were uh, Denny Hamlin in the in the Cup Series, overcoming some pit road penalties, and Lewis Hamilton taking advantage of Ferrari's misfortunes in Bahrain uh, for him to take yet another win to add to his impressive resume. Uh, before we get into uh, the racing news this week, um, Seth and I earlier today had a chance to catch up uh, with young Haley Deegan, who's a Toyota development driver uh, running the ARCA series and also running the K&N Pro series. Uh, she was kind enough to join us earlier today. So uh, we're going to go ahead and just play that um, interview segment for you now. Uh, we have Haley Deegan in with us, Toyota development driver who drives for Bill McNally Racing in the k and Series and also runs some ARCA races with Venturini Racing. Um, how are you, Haley? I'm doing great. Just hanging out, racing. All good. Yeah, yeah, we are very pleased to have you on the show here. So uh, uh, before we get started, just so our viewers can know a little bit about you, I'd just like to talk about your background a little bit. I mean, you come from a racing family. Um, your dad is well known among folks that enjoy uh, off-road racing and the X Games. And I believe you started uh, with off-road racing as well, and now you've transitioned to asphalt. So uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about your early career and um, how, how that transition to asphalt is going. Yeah, so I got my start in racing when I was eight years old in off-road trucks. Um, I raced that until I was about 15, 16 full-time. Um, I won two championships there, tons of races, and I ended up making a transition into stock car racing just because it's a bigger career, bigger future I could have here. And it's been going great in our first season of K&N. Um, I won a race, got a couple poles, started out this season. Um, I ended up winning a race and getting another pole, so it's been good. And like you said, you started off on off-road uh, racing. Have you ever had a chance to compete against your father? I really haven't. No. Uh, and would you like to do that one day, whether it's in a trophy truck or maybe, say, the Eldora truck race or one of the K&N dirt races? Yeah, I feel like if we put my dad in off, like an Eldora truck, it'd almost be unfair just because those trucks handle like stock cars. And he's an off-road racer, so I'd say if anything... Maybe racing as him in like a Pro 2 or something in the Lucas Hill series. And how was your transition from NAS from a uh, dirt into NASCAR? Was it easy? Was it difficult? It was, I feel like, easier than transitioning from pavement to dirt. Transitioning from dirt to pavement, I feel like, helped you. Um, it'd be really hard to go the opposite way. But in the end, I think it's gone really well. It took a little time to kind of uh, get in the gist of things. But now that I'm there, it's perfect. Now, you made your uh, stock car debut in the Cars Tour, if I remember correctly, at Tri-County Speedway, one of the more difficult racetracks, and then at Hickory Motor Speedway. What are some of the more difficult tracks that you've come across so far in asphalt racing? I would say there's, New Hampshire is the hardest track for me. I don't know why. I figured out that 
I'm really good at short flat tracks and banked high speed tracks. Uh, flat long tracks, not my strong suit. <laughs> And so are you looking forward then to Pocono uh, on the ARCA schedule for you a little later this year? Yeah, I mean, the biggest, um, I'd say, flat big track I've been on is New Hampshire, which I think Pocono, once you get to the super speedways, is a little different. But honestly, I don't know what to expect. Um, I'll let you know after. (laughs) Now, you mentioned that you got a couple wins, a, a number of polls. You broke the glass ceiling, essentially, in the Canaan Pro West Series. I know you want to be considered the best racer, not the best woman racer, but have you ever found yourself comparing your path to, say, Janet Guthrie or Shauna Robinson? I mean, Danica, she didn't really even race in the Canaan Series, so it's, like, hard to compare to. If she did, it was just a couple races. Uh, it wasn't, like... She came up in the grassroots of stock car racing. She was a go-karter and an indie car racer. Um, just a different path. And I think that it's hard to compare someone to, like, what you haven't done yet. So I think there's a lot of things that, like, I could compare to other drivers and stuff. But I think as of now, it's just figuring out what works for me and how hard I can push myself to succeed at this point. So what do you expect to be your biggest challenge as you transition from – the K&M Pro to ARCA competition? I'd say just the level of uh, experience those other guys have on the super speedways. I feel like I'll be just fine, like, on the shorter track. But as soon as you get to the super speedways, I've never driven on, like, super speedway-type tracks. So it's going to be um, a learning curve for me. But I don't know how it's going to go yet. I think that it's definitely going to be a difficult one. But I'm going to have good teammates that are surrounded around me uh, to learn from. And speaking of uh, teammates and this and that, you have a, lo- a number of younger teammates, uh, Derek Krause, Z- uh, Brittany Zamora, and then in the ARCA series as well, you'll have younger teammates. What do you think of the youth movement that's been co- going across motorsports, whether it's NASCAR, IndyCar, uh, Formula One? There's a lot of youth uh, in racing nowadays. Yeah, I think uh, the whole NASCAR and even all of our sports have been in a little bit of like a a funk of like uh, not of waiting for the younger generation to come in and that older generation just kind of like a midpoint. And I think uh, in this, I say about this year to last year has really been the turning point of the younger kids coming up and kind of showing their faces in the higher series. And there's a lot of really good kids that race and that moved into Xfinity and Trust Series. I'm curious to know because uh, in the truck series, we you have Natalie Decker who recently was out in Spain testing for the W series. What are your thoughts on that series? There's been a lot of people, even on our show, we've had uh, Pippa Man who is against the series and we've had Natalie Decker who participated in the series. What are your thoughts on it? I think that every person has an opportunity to be successful in whatever series they're in. And I think there is a reason why girls haven't been successful, or there hasn't been many to be successful in stock car racing. It just takes, I feel like, a different breed uh, of a person and aggressiveness. And I think that any girl can go race in any series if they have the funding and ability to. And I think that it's definitely tough to race against all the guys, but I would say, I'm not an open wheel racer, so I don't know. I'm a stock car slash off-road truck racer, so it's not really my suit. And that's not the path I'd be going towards. Completely understand that. And speaking of the fact that you're a off-road truck and a NASCAR racer, earlier this year you ran a dirt midget, if I uh, remember correctly. How did that go? I practiced in one. Just practiced in okay. race. Um, yeah, just for seat time uh, before the dirt race, which definitely helped after uh, before we won that race. And looking, granted, this might be years down the road, but I know you want to focus on NASCAR. Do you plan on just running maybe when you get to the Cup Series, just sticking with Cup or running a bit of everything like, say, Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick do? I really like those guys that go down and race super late models and go – I think uh, do stuff like that, and I think it's something that I will always go back and race off-road trucks and do that for fun just because it's where I came from. It's like having Kyle Larson or Ricky Stenhouse go run sprint cars 
and I think in uh, Christopher Bell. And I think it's something that where you came from in racing is where you feel comfortable and like at home. And I think I'll always keep doing that no matter what. Who have you gone to for advice uh, for say a track like New Hampshire, where you said you struggled or even tracks that you've run fairly well at? I'd say there's quite a few uh, younger drivers that I go to that race trucks in Xfinity that helped me out. Um, Quite a few of my friends. Um, I'd say it's just, Going to people who have experience at those tracks and have been not even just successful, just know the track. And I think it's something that's just the toughest part is getting around when you've never done something. So uh, just, I think, having simulator time, uh, just getting as much seat time as you can. Now, I'm, I'm curious if you set yourself a timeline to like make it to your ultimate goal, which I imagine is to get into the cup series. So uh, you're running ARCA this year, which is a, a good step up from the K&N and you're, you're running both those concurrently. Uh, so have, have you set yourself a, a timeline? And I know you're, uh, you're aligned with uh, the Toyota folks who can certainly uh, help you career wise. Yeah, I think that as of now, I for sure don't want to skip any level. Like I don't want to go straight from ARCA to Xfinity or something like that. And I think that, I don't think as of now, like, I'm fully ready to go full-time truck racing. I still think I have a lot to learn in, like, the ARCA series and K&N series before I make that transition. And I'd say when I do go to the truck series, I want to spend – the longer time I spend in the lower series, the better I'm going to be in the higher series. So I want to spend at least two years in the truck series before I move to, like, an Xfinity type thing. So it sounds almost like you're on a – say, a five-year plan, give or take, similar to what Christopher Bell has been doing. Exactly. Is there a specific track that you're most looking forward to competing at as you move up the ranks? I'm excited for Pocono, but the track that I really like is considered, I think, one of the more shorter NASCAR tracks is Iowa. Iowa is, like, one of my favorite tracks. And you will be running Iowa later this year in the k and combination race, correct? Yes. So Haley, who did you who did you have for racing heroes growing up? I know obviously obviously your dad, right? He's a he's a big yeah. star of the X Games. But uh, I mean, who did you kind of really pay attention to and watch? Who did you root for when you were very young watching racing? Oh man, I just I was constantly at the racetrack, so like I don't. I, it's hard for me to kind of like sit at a TV for hours and watch races, but I'm always keeping like up to date, like always watching. Um, and growing up, I didn't watch. Like, I didn't sit there for, like, five hours and watch a cup race every single weekend just because I was always racing. And so it's hard for me to, like, do those type things while you're at the track. And so now I obviously pay attention a lot more and watch pretty much every single race. But I'd say for people that I rooted for, I'd say I'm not, like, a big, like, have certain drivers. But I'd say right now, like, one of my favorite drivers is Kyle Larson. I really like his driving style. And, uh, I just, the whole generation, there's a new generation of racers coming up that have strong abilities that, but back then I didn't really have anybody. Is there a specific series uh, that you actually do watch uh, the entire race for today? Or do you just the watch se- the truck series? I watch from start to end. Now you've, uh, you're, you're transitioning towards, or you're shooting towards a, you know, goal uh, in NASCAR in the upper series. And that the whole series is, is it a little bit of flux with transition? We're doing different qualifying things and, and uh, they're, they're shaking up the schedule and they're looking to shake up the schedule again after 2020 into 2021. So, uh, you know, by the time you arrive there, I mean, I mean, what changes um, would you like to see for the good uh, to be there in place when you finally arrive in the cup series? I would say, I don't know about the whole series just because a lot could change by the time I get there. And there's a lot of um, potential for the series to change with uh, how sponsors are title sponsors. I know that has a big part in it, which I don't know. I honestly, I'm a racer. I'm there for good battles and good racing. And so that's what I'm kind of hoping for. Just curious. uh, Speaking of changes, if they were to say, add in a dirt race to either the Xfinity Series or the Cup Series, would you be all in favor for that? I'd be 100% in favor of that. <laughs> Just because I know it would help me. <laughs> <laughs> Haley, um, we wish you well in your upcoming season. I would like to uh, 
give you a few moments just to go ahead and plug your sponsors and plug plug your teams. Um, let us know where we can see you racing. Let us know where we can find you on social media uh, for our listeners. Yeah, so I usually am on Instagram and Twitter, just at Haley Deegan, but I have all like my merchandise and stuff at shopdegan38.com, which is like our family merchandise site. Um, all my merch is on there. That's pretty much it. All right. Well, well, we really appreciate you coming on. I know you have a busy schedule, and we really appreciate you taking out some time for us. So uh, we wish you well in the future, and then hopefully after you win a few more races, uh, we'll get you back on the on the show here later in the season to talk about uh, you battling for the championship. How's that sound? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. See ya. All right. Bye now. Okay. That was Haley Deegan. Um, very, uh, very impressive young woman, Seth. Wouldn't you say? I think she's got a great career ahead of her. Yes, indeed. And she is going to be running this weekend for a combination Bill McAnally uh, and Venturini car in the Canaan Pro West East Series race at Bristol. And you can watch that live on FansChoice.tv on f- Friday, I believe. All right. And again, I want to put a big thanks out to uh, the Toyota racing development folks for um, setting that interview up for us. So uh, we wish her the best of luck at Bristol. Um, speaking of best of luck, uh, Charles Leclerc certainly didn't have uh, the best of luck uh, mm-hmm. this past weekend in the Formula One race. But uh, I mean, on the bright side during qualifying uh, during the race, um, Ferrari or Leclerc, you know, specifically seemed to really be the, have the, the upper hand against the uh, Mercedes. Yeah, I mean, we we talked about post post Melbourne how poor um, Ferrari appeared at uh, you know down in Australia there, and Mercedes were saying, look, you know, this was a one off. Ferrari will get it right, and you know what? <laughs> they sure did in Bahrain. Um, you know, they they really sort of pushed the car, and um, you know, really sort of showed Mercedes that they're a good, you know, good four, five tenths of a second faster over a lap in qualifying, um, which I think is what everybody expected post preseason testing. Uh, so all throughout the weekend, uh, Charles Leclerc seemed to have his have an edge over, uh, over Sebastian Vettel there. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic again. I think looking at the bigger picture, not just how competitive Ferrari are, but are you going to see a similar situation to we saw a few years ago at Red Bull where Ricciardo came in and, and really pushed uh, Vettel and maybe sort of slightly I don't want to use the word tarnished Vettel's reputation but started to put him on the back foot a little bit um, so that's a fantastic battle that we're going to see you know throughout the end you know through the rest of the season and obviously Ferrari has said that you know they've got to in all but say we're going to implement team orders but you know they didn't this weekend really uh, they told Leclerc at, uh, at one point to, to wait two laps before he fast for tell, and he didn't listen to that advice. But um, you know, it's a fantastic, you know, it's a fantastic race by by Leclerc. I mean, this is what you've really grown to expect for the last two or three years. You know, watching him come through the junior category, and um, you know, watching him last year at Sauber, he, he's been very, very impressive. And you know, he's starting to. I mean, gee, he's only two two races into his Ferrari career, but. You know, this guy's this guy's the real deal. I think the way he handled himself and his attitude um, was was spot on. But yeah, um, I feel like I feel like he did a great job. But um, oh, uh, you, you know, can't. back to yeah, back to Vettel for a second though. He's yeah. currently, uh, as always, is being crucified in the press and in the public eye for mm. cracking under pressure. You know, which is, uh, I mean, do you feel like he was really cracking under pressure there? I, I know he made a, a couple of mistakes there and, and you know, he damaged the car and, and we saw the, the, the front wing come flying uh, off the nose and up under the car, uh, which was pretty spectacular in a night race with all the, the yeah, sparks flying and whatnot. Some, but um, some... I, do you feel like he's uh, cracking under pressure or, well, or are we just, you know, just seeing the worst, the worst of it on the weekend? I mean, for, for a start, there's some fantastic photographs of that uh, moment where his, his front wing goes under the nose. There, if, if anybody can get a chance to look at those photographs online, they're, they're pretty spectacular. But um, I don't think it was so much Vettel that cracked under pressure. I think it was Ferrari that cracked under pressure. You, know, you look at previous seasons where it's been you know Mercedes out front and Ferrari in third and fourth, for example, and Ferrari have short stopped somebody. 
Mercedes haven't always reacted in the same way, or if they have reacted, they've typically managed to maintain that gap. And it got shuffled back a little bit later in the race with it going to that two-stop strategy. And, you know, when, when Mercedes got on that set of the medium compound tyres rather than the soft compound, they were far more competitive on that medium compound tyre. So I... I think who I think as I say I think it was Fry that cracked into pressure. I think they just stuck with their own strategy and played it out. I don't think that on the first round of stops Mercedes were in the right position when they went onto the soft uh, compound tire for Hamilton. I think that was a bad move on their part. I think they should have gone onto the medium because obviously that was faster compound for them. Um, but it was interesting. I, I I think some of the strategy didn't help Vettel there and put him in a difficult position. Um, I mean, every driver faces fresh pressure all the time, and yeah, you you know you can look at the situation. Hamilton has just got past him, and Vettel spanned pretty much straight away. I think some of the things Vettel's got to look at is actually, and by far far from me to criticise one of the greatest drivers of our generation, but he has a habit of when he spins out, he just floors the throttle and out of almost frustration or anger. And shreds his rear tyres. I remember him doing that a couple of times last year. I think once was, I think one was in Austin. Once was in Austin last year potentially. Mm. I may be wrong there, but I, I seem to remember him in the past having this habit of just mashing the throttle and shredding his rear tyres. And that's what caused the the front wing to fail was the vibration that he'd caused by locking his tyres and flat spotting his rear tyres caused this vibration, which eventually ripped through the nose uh, or caused the nose to fail. So. I, I think there's a little bit of I don't I don't think pressure is the right word. I just I think he needs to be more calculated in these situations and the team needs to support him a little bit better. Yeah, I mean honestly, if you look at all the races that Mercedes has won, including this past one here, uh, they've won several races where they haven't necessarily had the fastest car, but no. they they planned a strategy and stuck with it in a very mm-hmm calm manner yeah uh, and without making a lot of changes and just have allowed the race to come back to them we see we saw it time and time again last year as the they continued to rack up wins that maybe they you know maybe they had a, a good third place car you know so yeah it's, i mean there's, it's, that... there's really something to be said for their their methodical approach to the race there was that spell last year i think where you had four or five races leading up to the summer shutdown where the fastest car didn't win the race um, and it was quite entertaining from the fans' perspective because you know you'd go through practice and Ferrari would be dominant and then Mercedes got the win or Mercedes would be dominant and then Ferrari got the win. I think it was, it was always quite good. But um, I think that I think what's different here is when there's been those instances in the past, it's been one or two tenths. Um, and now this in Bahrain, it was a big gap. You know, half a second almost in qualifying, um, and that is that will worry Mercedes. You know, there will be no kidding the guys in the you know back at back at Brackley at the factory there and at Brixworth where they do the engines that um, you know they've got a problem, and it's not a little problem. This is a big problem. You know, Mercedes. And you have, haven't been five, half a second behind for six or seven years, you know, since the Red Bull domination. So they've got a real problem there. And how do you react to that problem? It's all very well making a fast car, but sometimes it's a lot harder making a slow car fast. Ah, and very good. I, I think that they will. That's where they'll struggle. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how they react to that pressure. Because I say. A tenth or two can be set up, it can be tyre management, it can be whatever. There's a fundamental flaw here. Um, I don't think it's engine. Everybody's been saying it's engine. And I think the Ferrari engine is equal or slightly better than the Mercedes. I don't think it's half a second. I think the, the way that everybody's talking about the, uh, the Ferrari top line speed at, um, in Bahrain. But I think it's a combination of things. Yes, the engine's powerful, but also I think... The mechanical grip and the aero grip of the car have allowed them, it's so good that it's allowed them to actually 
skinny the car out a little bit and improve that top line speed because it's so good through the corners. So you can carry the same speed as the Mercedes through a corner, but the Mercedes is carrying more downforce to achieve that speed. So it's it's a little bit deceptive. Um, mind you, this, the Ferrari engine is, is not a bad engine, as I say. I don't think that's where the half second comes in. Um, I think it's, I, I, I genuinely be, believe it's a little bit of engine, but it's majority of it is, um, you know, mechanical and aero performance. Certainly. So let's uh, let's talk about some of the other performers, you know, behind the uh, behind the Mercedes and Ferraris. Um, Lando Norris had a really good day uh, Very good. in the McLaren. So um, is it are things looking up for McLaren? I mean, they're they're with Renault now, and and Renault had problems of their own. I believe they lost both cars uh, to uh, engine related failures. Uh, although the McLarens kept running, but um, d- do you see? Yeah. Uh, you know, Lando Norris uh, up in the mix a little more this year, or is it just he just got lucky here? Well, I mean, if you you know you go on a sample of two, which is all you've got to rate the kid on, and he's been pretty damn good in all fairness. You know, race in in Melbourne wasn't wasn't great. You know that happens. Um, but you know, qualifying for both races, I think he's made Q three in in both races so far. So there's obviously a lot of speed there. Uh, excuse me. There's you know, science. I think has retired from both races now. He did retire with a couple of laps ago with gearbox issues, and he got caught up in an incident early in the race. So he was off strategy. So it was difficult to really put into context where um, where science was. But certainly, they are going in the right direction. I think is a fair statement. Um, they're not there yet, obviously, um, but they can certainly mix it with that whatever they want to call it, the Formula 1.5 teams, you know. Um, you, you've got the likes of Renault, Haas, McLaren. They're going to be fighting for that seventh place in reality behind the Mercedes, Ferrari and Red Bull. So that's going to be a, probably as good a battle as the front three teams, really. Um, I think I think Red Bull have been could have drifted a little bit and have sort of sat in that solid third place while Ferrari and Mercedes thrash it out. Um, but, you know, what teams like McLaren, Haas, uh, Renault have got to do is they've got to be around there at the end of the race when the big teams have the bad races and have a couple of retirements or have an accident or whatever it may be and pick up the fourth, fifth places in those events. Um, one one team that I thought was very disappointing over the weekend was uh, the Haas team. You know, qualifying was great for them. Again, Magnussen up in sixth or seventh I think it was as a qualifying performance and just just went backwards throughout the race there'll be a lot of head scratching going on at um at, well whichever base they're based at in uh, in Haas that seems to be spread all over the globe but um you know not not really what you want to see it's it's almost like a history repeating itself from from 2018 um you know they've built a good car there and worked obviously quite closely with Delara on building a pretty Pretty quick car, though, with that Ferrari power unit. Um, but they're just making too many mistakes. And people will turn around and criticise the driver lineup, and you know, right, quite rightly and wrongly in some cases. But that wasn't Magnussen on Sunday. That wasn't his fault. He's a better driver than that. So um, you'll have to look at that. And then, as you say, again, Renault seemed to sort of hit the self-destruct button in more ways than one. I mean... You saw from the onboard, Hulkenberg had a huge engine failure. Something, you know, was rattling around in there. It sounded like a stone in a tin can, um, which is never good from a from an engine. And then within within ten seconds, um, Ricciardo had a, a failure, not quite as dramatic, but obviously a, a pretty major systems failure, which appeared to cause damage to the electrical system and, and meant that uh, the car couldn't be collected from the side of the track. So. They had to go into a safety car, which, in a way, I think saved Charles Leclerc's um, podium chances. I think if the race had stayed under, uh, you know, without the safety car towards the end of the race, um, I think Verstappen would have caught him and passed him. So, in, in a way, I, think, you know, he, you know, the kid drove such a fantastic race that, without any hesitation, he deserved to be on the podium, and I'm glad he got there. Um, I thought that. You know, Hamilton's comments post-race, even on the warm-down lap, were fantastic. Um, you know, I'm not Hamilton's biggest fan. I think that's, that's pretty well known. But you've got to give credit where credit's due to the kid. And, uh, you know, he he 
handled that situation really, really well. And talking to Shell post race and the things he said on the radio were very, very good. I thought some of the actions by some of the Mercedes guys in the garage, Toto Wolf excluded, he was, you know, I think he, he got the bigger picture. But some of the mechanics jumping up and down and clapping when Hamilton passed Leclerc. I mean, it wasn't exactly a wasn't exactly around the outside of a rouge, was it really? I mean, come on, guys. And then some of the comments by his race engineer post-race on the radio, again, were like, mm, come on, you know, show a little bit of class. And, you know, Hamilton did that. So, you know, credit where credit's due on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Hamilton is, the, the you know, the, the senior ambassador for the sport pretty much this day and age with, with the amount of wins and championships. Yeah, so it's it's nice. It was really nice to see the little exchange uh, in the before they went up to the podium that um, that we were yeah. able to see on the television where he he, he was told uh, Charles you know there's a lot there's a lot more opportunities coming this is the first one so um, it's a tough break so uh, yeah good on Hamilton for that so let's talk about Red Bull for a moment they're um mm-hmm. they're they're with uh, the much improved Honda engine uh, but there seems to be a serious gap uh, especially in qualifying between um uh, Gasly and um, Verstappen there. Is uh, is this just a learning curve for Pierre Gasly or is Verstappen just that good? Well, you always seem to have... Uh, well, I'll tell you who's going to be loving this is Ricky Yardo, isn't it? I mean, he's you know he's going to be uh, thinking, I'd look, uh, you know, doesn't make me look... <laughs> um, you know, makes me look a lot better. But um, when you see these guys, you know, come up from the... Red Bull Junior team to the Red Bull Senior team. You look at it in the past, uh, you know, Ricciardo and Kvyat and now Gasly and Verstappen. It either seems to go really, really, really well or <laughs> it's a complete train wreck. And uh, Unfortunately for Pierre Gasly, it's looking like a little bit of a train wreck. Um, I think the kid's good. He's got no doubt there's talent there. No doubt there is talent there. Is there... How shall I put this? Is there Red Bull talent there? Is there Helmut Marco talent there? Uh, jury's out on that one. Yeah, but, time, time will tell. So, but now, he's he's yeah, it's not a great start, is it for the kid? Unfortunately, I hope he's wrong. I hope he does turn it round. But it's awful early in the season for us to write him off, yeah, and then put uh, well put him back in a tar or awesome He'll line. be we've seen he'll it be putting pressure on himself. He knows the score. He knows that Verstappen's first race in the Red Bull, he won. Yes. So that's the benchmark. Now, admittedly, the two Mercedes took each other out of that race, but there's his benchmark. And the first two races have not been circuits that you would consider to be Red Bull circuits. But you look at the differential between Verstappen and Gasly. Oh boy. That's big numbers, very big numbers. Yeah, yeah, a lot of cars between them. So now, Seth, you had an opportunity to uh, sit and watch the Formula One race. Um, yes, what were, I did. What, what were your impressions? Well, it was nice to see somebody different up front. Granted, I know it's a Ferrari, and Ferrari has been one of the more dominant teams. But being more of a casual observer for Formula One, it was nice to see Leclerc be as dominant and again um i have to laugh at that because we're so cynical uh talking about dominance being a good thing at times and for some drivers versus other drivers but uh that being said uh it was nice to see some of the different names be up front be talked about have a chance at least he was able to get a podium it's not much of a consolation Plus, he also had the fastest lap, so he also got the bonus point from that as well. Again, not much of a consolation, but he's definitely going to be one of the drivers to contend with in the future. Yeah. Now, speaking of that point for the fastest lap, right? That's something new in Formula One this year. It's something that we've, you know, we've had in IndyCar in the past, mm-hmm. and you know, points for qualifying, and NASCAR's got points for leading laps. Uh, Formula One has never had the so-called bonus points, but uh, they decided mm-hmm. to go ahead and try that this year. And th- that one point is, uh, well, that's what uh, Bottas is leading the championship by right now, uh, based mm-hmm. on his um, fastest lap uh, in Melbourne. So, Richard, as a as a Formula One guy and a, and a lifelong mm-hmm. observer, what what are you what are your thoughts on this bonus point for fastest lap? Well. It has been around in Formula One uh, in the fifties, and I think it was. I think it stopped in maybe the late fifties, early sixties. So it's not a completely new thing, but 
for ninety nine percent of the viewership of the sport, yes, it is a new thing. Um, I, I'd like to see it. I think the fastest lap to the car that finishes in the top ten. They say fastest lap. You know, you only get a point if you finish in the top 10 and you have the fastest lap overall. So that means somebody could set the fastest lap early in the race and then retire and there's no bonus point awarded. I, I'd like to see there be at least a point every race. And if you don't finish in the top 10, then it goes to the car in the top 10 with the fastest lap, if you see my logic behind that. Yes, um, yes. So, so that way there's that one point available for somebody to get. Exactly. There's always that. Yeah. The, pri- the, pri- so, I mean, the, the prize doesn't go unclaimed. Exactly. Um, what about what about a point for pole position? Would you be would you be in favor of that? I, I think poles are are relatively mm. difficult to come by if your name's not Lewis Hamilton. Well, yeah, I mean, eh, I'd like to see that potentially. I, here's one that I'm going to throw out there: give a constructor's point for the fastest pit stop, just to the constructor, not the driver, just to the constructor. Give a constructor's point for the fastest. That's pit an stop. interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for for a pole position. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you're rewarding skill, aren't you? At the end of the day, you know, that's, that's the purpose of it. You're rewarding a skill and it's not, you know, it's not luck. You don't get fastest lap by luck. You don't get pole position by luck. You don't get some of these other rewards by luck. I I wouldn't agree with doing the most laps led. I don't think that because in Formula One, that's generally quite static. It's not like cup race cup racing where you can lead 400 laps and then somebody punts you out the race and you know you don't uh, don't get any points for it but um no i i wouldn't have a problem with fast with pole position as well as as long as as long as it doesn't get silly as long as you don't get where you get five points for qualifying first and four points for qualifying second or something like that you know as long as the ticket just a point because yeah, it's enough. yeah, they, they tried that ridiculousness with the Indy 500 a couple of years ago. Yeah, you know, all, it, all the it, points for qualifying. Yeah, I'm glad they yeah, uh, it, they, it, they backed away from that one. It rewards, you know, an achievement, but to the same extent, it doesn't have a huge bearing on the championship. I mean, at the end of the day, fastest lap and pole position would be 42 points over the course of a season, so that's nearly two races. So, you know, it could have quite a, a, a bearing on it. And it would be interesting to look back historically over the last five years if it would have changed the outcome of any of the championships. Um, mind you, I don't think it would have changed the outcome of pole position, but you could potentially say it changed the outcome of fastest lap because, you know, a guy could maybe not push. And whereas, like Alonso in Abu Dhabi in whenever it was, 2012, possibly, um, when he was with Ferrari and had a chance to win the championship but couldn't get past um, Vitaly Petrov, you know, he could have backed off by five, by five or ten seconds and had a gone for fastest lap and that could have won in the championship. I, I'm speaking off the top of my head here. I don't know that's for a fact. But it would be interesting to have a look at the statistics and see if the championship outcome would have changed over the last, um, you know, five or ten years. Oh, certainly. I mean, that's what whenever there's a, an extra point or two available, it, it changes your strategy towards the whole thing. I mean, just look at, you know, NASCAR with all the different kind of bonus points they have. Now they have the, the stage points. Yeah. And if you recall, you know, a year before last, Martin Truex was able to sail all the way through the playoffs, you know, based on the amount of stage points he had just kind yeah. of stockpiled through the whole thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, lead, I, lead to a championship for him. Yeah, and I do think that's, a, you know, you couldn't have anything you know, um, affecting that, uh, you know, the the one issue I have with cup racing and the way they do their playoffs is you don't necessarily get the best driver winning the championship. You know, t- you typically you get something there or thereabouts, but I think, in all fairness, you'll probably admit it, Joey Logano, was he the most dominant driver in 2018? No. You know, no. you have to look at a Kevin Harvick or a Kyle or, Busch or, or Kyle something Bush. like that. Absolutely, yeah, but, you know, but at the same time, it's... It's patterned after stick and ball sport. Does it? Does the best football team of the year always win the Super Bowl? You know, you uh, remember, remember no. when the Giants beat the the Patriots when the Patriots were sixteen and zero? Yeah, for and, sure. And so it, it's it's who's ever yeah. Don't best, remind me about that one. Yeah, who's, ever, who, who, who's ever best on that given day? That's and that's that's the price you pay. But who, it's who, a marathon, not a sprint. You know, exactly. That way, on the bright side, you know, it's they, they just take it down to four drivers. They don't say everyone in the chase, whoever finishes, you know. So, but it always does. It does open up the possibility that that all four, you know, championship drivers can crash on the first lap at the season finale, and whoever 
whoever stops closest to the finish line will win the champion. <laughs> you know, the, oh, yeah. it, it could happen. It, it hasn't so far. I believe every year in that playoff system, the, the, the champion has actually won the season finale. Am I correct, Seth? Uh, correct for the Cup Series. For the Cup Series, of course. Of yeah, course, so. that's uh, that's convenient, isn't it? All right. um, well, this would be, nice, be a nice segue to start talking about the NASCAR race. But before we do, um, Richard, are there any other... Any other stories in Formula One that we want to touch on before we before we move away too far from it? So today and tomorrow, or Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, depending on when you're listening, obviously, um, is the first in-season test uh, post Bahrain. So the highlights from that from the first day of that test have been Alonso back in the McLaren, working as a Pirelli development driver, who said the 2019 McLaren's better than the 2018 in every way. Um, Strange that he's not in it then. Anyway, um, and also Ferrari uh, put a, a young kid called Schumacher in, in the car. Um, I don't know if he's got any pedigree in racing or not, but he seemed to do okay. Um, yeah, how, yeah. How, how did Mick Schumacher make it? I didn't get a he chance to look up, at the time, He ended but... up finishing second in the timing sheets. Uh, Verstappen was fastest, and Schumacher was about three tenths behind, but on the soft compound whereas Verstappen was on the hard or the medium compound so if it rolled over from the race you're talking about maybe three or four tenths of a second different maybe half a, se- half a tenth half a second different in those comp- tire compounds mind you it did rain today in Bahrain so that throws a little bit of a and shake and, up to those numbers and if I remember what I read correctly uh this was the first time since 2003 that you had both the Schumacher and Alonso on the same timesheet, and the first time since I think '94 that you had a Verstappen and a uh, yeah, it could well be could Schumacher well be. on the same timesheet. Yep, no, you're very right. It could could well be. Um, as obviously, I don't know if Magnussen was in there as well. I don't know if Magnussen tested today for Haas, but you could throw that because obviously his father did a few races for for Stewart Racing there in the in the mid to late '90s. But um, I mean, briefly. Yeah, now wasn't up. wasn't Pietro Fittipaldi testing as well? Yes. So so you got, so you've got a Fittipaldi yeah. on those timesheets as well. You know what I mean? You get, oh, you get yeah. all, all all these great names. <laughs> you do. Back, so. um, but you quickly just took up to touch on on uh, Mick Schumacher. It's, it's a very strange career, really. Um, you know, did a little bit in some of the German junior categories, and then had a year in Formula Three, and didn't really dig up any trees in his first year you know I think he got a couple of podiums here and there and finished like fifth or sixth in the championship you know a solid run but nothing amazing and then for the second half second season he was racing in that series again the first half the season yeah pretty bland a couple of podiums and you know solid points going nothing crazy and then mid-season he just goes on this run where he really wins like eight out of the last ten races and, and claims the championship. So, in all fairness to the kid, he's only really had six months where he's been, you know, somebody that you take note of. And he's running, you know, he's running in the GP2 in Bahrain. Admittedly, it was just, oh, sorry, Formula 2 now. Admittedly, it was his first Formula 2 race. So, you've got to give the guy a little bit of leeway there. But it wasn't, incredibly dominant you know i think he had an eighth place finish and a fifth place finish it wasn't uh, you know anything to write home about and with prima motorsport the team that he's with he'd hoped for something a little bit better i mean the kid's got the best equipment out there you know uh, which wouldn't surprise anybody to hear so for him to make it in formula one he's got to have i think he's got to be really challenging for the championship this season um, I think anything less than that, and it'll be a struggle. And if he does make it to Formula One without being really competitive in Formula Two, then he's just riding on the to- cocktails, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, would he even be in that Ferrari testing this week if 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 it weren't for you know the the all the championships that his dad won for Ferrari? No. Yeah, ex- I mean, exactly. I think he, exactly. He, I he, think might, he be... might be being looked at, but I, yeah. I don't think he'd be at this stage of his career. Be invited no, to sit uh, that Ferrari, I think, yeah. I mean, hey, the fact is, you won the European <laughs> Formula Three Championship. That says a lot. You know, you look at the past winners of that championship, and it's a who's who in in racing. But you know, he'd, he'd certainly be in Formula Two. I don't, I don't doubt that. But again, 
you know, you'd have to be looking at somebody, you know, he may have got a test at Alpha like he's driving because he's driving for them on the Wednesday. But he certainly would not be in a Ferrari. Um, you know, I because I, you know, I know Vettel's driving for Ferrari tomorrow. In a way, I feel a little bit sorry for Charles Leclerc. I mean, geez, what more can the guy do to get more track time? You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so... All right, so where, where are we off to next in Formula 1? China in two weeks, which will be Formula 1's 1,000th race, which um, Liberty are making a huge deal of. I don't think anybody's going to notice. That's the 1,000th gonna... race since the... For start of the Formula 1 World Championship in 1950. 1950 right? Okay, yeah, because yeah. Formula 1 act, racing actually traces back farther, but, you know... When oh, they... 1904 or something to some right, right. Well, they, somewhere they in France, start... yeah. Grand Prix racing and whatnot, so much yes. to the, but yeah, but yes. we're talking about the, the 1950 when they first established the World Correct. Championship. The 1, Correct. So, race. I think that's actually um, a pretty cool stat. Oh, it is, but I, it is. I, I, I uh, the part of the problem is it's in China, um, which means is it going to? Will the Chinese? If it was at Silverstone or Monza or Spa or you know, Monaco or somewhere like that, I think it would be a lot better for the sport. I think the fact that it's um, in China, I mean, yeah, they get a lot of people turning up there, but the majority of the fans that turn up there go because it's somewhere to be seen rather than the diehard fanatical Formula One fans. So it's a shame, really, as I say, if they could have had it, um, you know, a, a more appropriate venue i think it yeah, would have been more, a lot more traditional over. venue yeah I mean, monica yeah. would have been nice but i i guess you can't jumble the schedule that no, much. of course not good so. this is this isn't nascar after all and, and, and i'm sure that whoever put the schedule together they, they didn't cross their mind oh that's the thousandth race until after yeah. it was said done I said, exactly and we're, gonna, and we're gonna be in china yeah <laughs> so it'd be interesting to see what liberty do uh and, and how they they sell that event but um uh, I, I think it's it's more of a side note to to what could be a fantastic race. I mean, you know, um, you, if if everything goes according to plan, Ferrari will be quick and Leclerc will be quick and he'll go out and win the race. And you know, the kid gets his break at the next possible opportunity. And that's the great thing about racing: there's always next week or in two weeks' time. So uh, hopefully he gets just rewards for what was a fantastic weekend last weekend, and he can continue that over in uh, over in uh, in China. Fantastic! All right, now Seth. So the Cup cars uh, were down in Texas, as were the Xfinity and trucks. Uh, everybody was in Texas yes. this week. All right. So uh, our big winner of the day was Denny Hamlin, who he came back from a couple of pit road uh, penalties. He uh, actually but, came back from three separate issues, including two pit road penalties. Right, but one of the one of the the interesting things that we haven't seen in a while was Jimmy Johnson leading a big pile of laps, huh? Yeah, Jimmy Johnson led sixty laps more than all of 2018 combined. <laughs> well, uh, there he, you go. He, he got his first pole position since 2016, and finished in the top five for the first time. Since the Coke 600 last year. Yes, yeah, sir. It, it <clears throat> almost reminds me of the, the guy in the Monty Python film that says, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. <laughs> so, and, soon and, will be. <laughs> and Hendrick Motorsports had two cars finish in the top 10 for the first time since Kansas last year. Uh, Chevrolet was actually fairly competitive. Uh, you had Jimmy Johnson lead 60 laps. You had William Byron lead 15. You had Chase Elliott lead 35. In total, they led about 110, uh, if not a little bit more laps than that with uh, Austin Dillon in some of the uh, pit road exchanges and stuff like that. But Chevrolet was actually fairly competitive. They weren't exactly on par with Toyota and exactly on par with Stuart Haas but they were there. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I figured it'd be sooner rather than later that Chevrolet would turn the corner here. Well, or, or until NASCAR would institute a, a parity rule to, well, to, to um, kind of tighten things up. But from uh, there, what I've heard, uh, Hendrick in particular has made some, uh, new hires and, uh, found some stuff recently that they were missing. 
Are we talking engine stuff or suspension stuff or top secret stuff that we'll never know? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever, whatever, whatever it was they found is certainly translated to uh, them having a much better better showing at the track on the weekend there. So. Yeah, it was a good showing, and the race but, overall uh, was. The race overall was pretty much what we've expected uh, from this package. A lot more like uh, the truck series in which you couldn't get away from each other. There was plenty of passing. Uh, in fact, passing, there were uh, legitimate passes or confirmed passes uh, throughout the race that weren't pit road or under caution. 3,576. Wow. And this race last year only had 895. Yeah, I did feel like the quality of racing was quite good. I thought it was quite entertaining. Um, and hopefully this will, you know, they're, they're figuring this package out a little, a little better. But I, I thought the quality of racing, you know, from what I was able to see was quite entertaining. We didn't see anybody getting, getting too far away. Um, you know, we didn't see anybody, you know, we didn't see any cars in big, packs either in danger of having the big one so it was i think it just it kind of set the balance nicely you know between what we'd like to see out of a good decent stock car race it, what i did think was interesting sorry is you know looking at the uh you know it's one of the few tracks where both indycar and nascar run together and looking at you know the track looks small with a stock car on there and it looks huge with an indycar on there i thought there was quite a a fun sort of comparison from a spectator standpoint who's seen both races there to, to look at the difference, um, you know, in the cars out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, f- you find the same thing in Indianapolis as well. True. Yeah. I missed that one, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> look, the, the funny, the funny thing is that, you, in, you know, in Indianapolis, if you're used to watch the Indy cars, where if you, if you go to watch the stock cars there, it's like, Guys, is that guy ever going to make it down the straightaway? Yeah. They look, uh, you know, they they look so much slower. Yeah, you know. But but I digress, Seth. Sorry, now, yeah, I interrupted uh, that. Oh, no, you're fine, you're fine. Uh, <laughs> now, as I was uh, about to say, we also had the Xfinity and the Truck Series in action, like Frank had said. Uh, in the Xfinity Series and Truck Series, Kyle Busch won both races. Uh, although in the Xfinity Series. Christopher Bell dominated. He led 127 of the 200 laps. And the race came down to a caution with uh, about 11 laps to go when they restarted with six laps to go. Bell did not get a good restart, and Kyle Busch was able to get out front and cruise to victory. Uh, Otherwise, it was about to come down to a fuel mileage race. Uh, And also in the Xfinity Series, we had... Ryan Sieg and his family-owned team uh, steal the second stage win of the race. And that's his first stage win. He finished in the top 10. In all of the races this year, that family-owned team has not finished worse than 11th. That's uh, that's uh, that's not bad. That, I, that's, that's good prize money for a small family team. And this race was also the qualifying race for the Xfinity Dash for Cash the next four weeks, no cup drivers, or next four races, I should say, no cup drivers in the Xfinity Series field. The four Dash for Cash drivers will be Tyler Reddick, Christopher Bell, Chase Briscoe, and Michael Annette. And each race, there's a $100,000 bonus to whichever one of them can finish the highest. And if they were to finish the highest in all four, it's a $1 million bonus. So they could make $100,000 per race, $400,000 total, well, then they kick it to a million? Yes. That's Wait. a nice incentive for these guys. You wonder where that money comes from. Oh, that <laughs> comes from Xfinity. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, well, and, good on them. And you know, it's good to showcase the stars of that sport. Uh, but but sometimes I feel like, you know, and we've had this discussion uh, a zillion times in the show, the, the, <laughs> the lack of the marquee names, and they're really just, uh, the, the fan interest is, is non-existent. Well, the Truck Series will have a similar program later in the year, uh, the which that's the Triple Truck Challenge. I'll get to that when we that comes up later in the season. But in the truck race itself, Kyle Busch dominated. I, I mean, there's no other way to put it. He led 97 of the 147 laps. 
Uh, Stuart Friesen had a chance to, to catch him, but the truck just got too tight and he was never able to really hold it underneath Kyle Busch. Uh, Grant Enfinger, one of the series regulars, was able to get a stage win. Otherwise, the truck race was relatively quiet. There was a number of crashes, uh, most notably Anthony Alfredo's truck going up in flames after he uh, pounded the turn two wall. But other than uh, the single truck incidents here and there, it was a relatively quiet race. All right, so where are we off to next? Bristol. Bristol. Bristol day race, right? Because the night yes. race is later in the season. So, yeah, Bristol just – I hope that – I'd love to see what kind of package they worked out for Bristol because uh, it, is it the, just – Bristol used to be one of the most exciting races on the, the calendar. It's the 750 horsepower with the tall spoilers. Uh, everyone is saying expect speeds to be high. That would be good. I mean, Bristol used to be one of the most exciting – races on the calendar but just lately the last couple have been snoozers you know i know they've they've, they've changed the turns and the, and the surface and this and that and they've, they've kind of wrecked it but uh hopefully whatever they're, they're planning for this weekend will really kind of maybe bring some of that that bristol excitement back i'd love to see a great race on that little bull ring they've got a new tire compound as well for this yes. weekend, haven't they yes and that's uh intended to cope with the higher speeds of the uh, are they putting that uh, stood the, down on the bank the corner. VHT yeah. yes and they did put it down at Texas as well uh, okay I'm with you I'm with you I didn't know if it's in that there all right well we've just got a few moments left so we'll just go around and everyone can make a pick for Bristol um, who do you like Seth uh let's go with Jimmy Johnson okay yeah why not why not he's, he's won several there and Richard who do you like for Bristol hmm Chase Elliott Chase Elliott. And you know what? I almost feel like um, saying what Seth likes to say is that Martin Truex Jr. will get his first <laughs> short track win. So uh, I'm going to go with Martin and see if he really does get that first short track win. So, um, But before we go, I do want to mention that this weekend coming up, the IndyCars will be at Barber Motorsports Park in Birmingham. Um, lovely racetrack down there. Uh, always produces a good race. Um and it's uh, our friend Joseph Newgarden has won the last couple down there. So uh, let's uh, let's all make a quick pick for Barber. I'm going to pick Joseph Newgarden. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> and, Seth, who would you like to pick? Colton Herda. Colton Herda, back-to-back wins. That's a bold pick. I like it, Seth. I like it a lot. Richard, what do you feel? Willpower. Will Power, another good pick. Another good. Oh pick. no, no, it wasn't a pick. You asked what I felt, and I said Will Power. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So who do you who do you think will win the race? I think it will be Will Power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, guys. Well, we are just about out of time, so I want to thank you, uh, Seth. I want to thank you, Richard, uh, Gray. Uh, we're thinking about you. We'll have you back on next week. Uh, thanks again to uh, Toyota Racing Development for uh, setting up the Haley Deegan interview. I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network and iHeartRadio and Spreaker and uh, and all you folks that tune in to listen. We'll talk to you next week. Good night. Who? 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 Who?